I think we had a great, great discussion this morning. I certainly, we certainly appreciate all the comments we had from the, and questions we had. There were some very good questions, a lot of interest. Uh, and there's certainly a, a lot of input from the panel. We certainly, again, want to thank the panelists for their uh, sharing their, their story with us. And now it's time to continue on with uh, some more about Yen, what we've learned. And we'll take it back to Dennis. So if we could please have your attention. They're getting there. <laughs> All right. Dennis, welcome back. All right. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate the great discussion that we had earlier. And you guys touched on some of the things that I'm going to share some more information with you. Um, about but during the break I had a couple questions about is it too late to sign up for yen it is not there is a notepad out on the uh, registration table on the the far end um, if just all you gotta do is put your first name last name and a phone number on it if you want I will get in touch with you I have all your contact information because you all registered um, so it's not too late to sign up if you want to sign up but I gotta have you do it today um, because we we kick off on Friday um, so I got to get you your information um, uh, tomorrow uh, in order to be part of that. So if you do want to sign up, um, today is the last day, but sign up before you leave um, if you would. So I wanted to share a little bit more information about the, uh, some of the, just kind of sh some data points and some things that we saw, trends in the data, and just some information. And then if you guys have questions along the way, please feel free to, to holler and stop me along the way. I'd rather have this as a kind of a discussion than than just a one-way kind of a lecture type thing. So um, if you have questions, please, please don't hesitate. So the first thing that uh, I want to start with is what are the biggest correlations to high yields and then that percentage of yield potential? So this is looking at all 250 data columns and say of those 250 items, which ones are the most closely related to yield? Which, which ones trend with yield and which ones do not? So, um, at the bottom of the screen there, it says correlation does not equal causation. That's pretty important. A correlation just is if, if one unit goes up, what happens to this other uh, data point? Does that go up with it? Does it maintain steady? Does it decrease? Um, so a correlation is just how do these two things relate to each other? So, um, and, and so I've broken this up into like a strong correlation and a negative correlation, and then I'll show you some stuff that was, had, was not related to yield that I thought would be, um, that was a bit of a surprise. So we'll start, the top of this chart are things that have a strong positive relationship. That means that as yield goes up, this item goes up um, with it. The thing that was the most strongly um, correlated was grain biomass, which makes sense, right? Okay, the, the more grain biomass you have, the higher your yield is, so that makes pretty good sense. The second thing was the percent of yield potential. So those of you that got the highest percent of yield potential also had tended to have the higher yields, which that kind of makes sense. Um, next is total biomass per acre. That had a correlation of uh, 0.759, okay? So the total above ground biomass is strongly correlated with the yield that you get. So you got, if you think about that, what is important? That's developing your crop canopy. What does that look like? You want to capture as much sunlight um, energy as possible and take up as much water and make sure you got all the nutrients there um, because that canopy is your factory. That's what's producing your yield. Um, and and that, that showed up very strongly um, in this data set. Um, next thing there is grain nitrogen. Uh, it's 72% uh, correlation, which means that the amount of nitrogen that gets into the grain is highly correlated with the actual yield. So, um, nitrogen nutrition is very important. Uh, next one is crop nitrogen uptake in terms of total pounds per acre, which is sort of related to the, the one previous. Um, the grains per meter squared. So we calculated, uh, we, we collected those yield component samples and we calculated, we, we threshed them and we counted spikelets and all that stuff. And then we calculated how many grains, individual kernels, there were per square meter or per square yard, okay? the more kernels you produce, and this is not 
number of tillers, this is not number of spikelets, it's all that things combined into how many total kernels did you produce, that was strongly correlated with um, yield. Um, and then the next thing there is the straw biomass. We measured the straw biomass as well, and that was also strongly related, which is kind of your, your total biomass. Um, so, you know, when you think about, we want to produce as much biomass as possible, yet we don't want our crop to lodge, right? So how can we push that crop to produce as much above ground biomass as we can, as well as below ground, because we need the root system, but to produce as much biomass as we can, um, so that it can convert that into yield. So if you think about planting shorter varieties, applying plant growth regulators, um, you know, how does that stuff all impact your total above ground biomass? Um, the, with a plant growth regulator, the goal is to thicken the stem and shorten the inner nodes so the overall crop height is lower, but it should not be lowering your total biomass. If it is lowering your biomass, you're applying it probably when it's too cold and you're getting some injury to your crop. Um, so that's something that's pretty important that we want to um, take into account. So these things that are listed here have a strong positive correlation. These next group of things have kind of a weak correlation. There is a little bit of a correlation, but it's not real strong. Um, and so those things include the number of heads per meter squared, the total nitrogen pounds applied per acre, um, iron in the flag leaf sample, uh, average crate, average crop height, um, the average spikelets per ear, chaff per dry matter, we actually threshed out and we weighed the amount of chaff. Um, in Europe, they're, they're looking at the amount of chaff in the head, the weight of that compared to the grain weight. And there's some relationship that they're looking for there. And I don't understand exactly what they're looking for, but we're collecting that data here. Um, and then the nitrogen sulfur ratio was also had a weak positive correlation with that. And by nitrogen sulfur ratio, that means we, we've kind of set a number at 17. So for every 17 pounds of nitrogen, you should be applying at least one pound of sulfur. Um, a lot of the growers in this were somewhere around that 13, 14 uh, ratio. So for every 13 or 14 pounds of N, they were putting on one pound of sulfur. Um, that was a question that came up at break too as well. We talked a little bit about boron, but we didn't even mention sulfur. Well, yes, sulfur is important. Um, and then over on this other side are things that had a negative correlation. So as yield went up, these things went down. So it's important to know what these things are that are impacting yield as well. Um, and so those things include uh, the number of grains uh, set per gram of chaff, uh, the crop protection spend, and this was our really rough attempt at identifying economics here, which was a prime, probably a poor excuse of actually doing economics. But um, So as the yield went up, the crop protection spend per bushel of grain decreased, which you would want. So yield goes up, your crop protection cost per bushel is going down. That's, that's, it's a negative correlation, but it's to your benefit. Okay. Um, the amount of percent sand in the soil sample was negatively related. So as the amount of sand increased, yields decreased um, in your soil type, so that kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, the sulfur in the grain sample, um, as the sulfur content in the grain sample decreased, grain yield increased. I don't understand exactly why that is the case, but that was the trend. Um, uh, magnesium in the grain sample, same thing, uh, potassium and calcium all in the grain sample as well as magnesium and then sulfur in the tissue sample was also negatively related to the grain yield. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that? Okay, so there were some things that I really thought, yeah, these are for sure gonna be correlated with uh, grain yield, and they were not. Seeding date, seeding rate, estimated solar amount of radiation captured, uh, the amount of available water captured, the thousand grain weight, the grain yield potential itself, um, not as a percent, but the actual bushel number. Harvest index was not related to grain yield. The number of grains per head, the grain fill period, and then the crop protection spend on a dollars per acre basis was not related. So why do you think some of these things were not necessarily correlated with yield? This data is only from 43 farms from one growing season. We have a very limited amount of data um, I mean, we ha we're collecting a lot of data, but we only have it from 43 farms. We need to get this data from 
um, a few hundred farms and we need to see this data over multiple growing seasons, then we might start seeing some of these come true. And so I, I sent this slide to our collaborators in uh, the UK and I said, you know, what are you guys seeing? This is what we're finding. And they said, we're finding the same thing. So um, these things in the UK are tending to not be correlated with yield. So when you think about how are we going to manage our crop, you know, what factors here do we start focusing on? So let's talk about differences between the high yield growers and versus the lower yield growers. Of those 43 in the yen, in the bottom there in the blue, it says the average grower, uh, average of growers above and below the yield of 115. So 115 bushels was the average of all yen growers. So what I did is I took their information for anybody that was above that, and I took an average of them, and then all of them that were below that, I took an average of them. So that's your above and below. So for a number of different factors. So um, the difference between the above and below and seeding date, the above gr group is um, planting about 3.7 days earlier. They're planting about 140,000 seeds less per acre. They're planting about a third of an inch deeper on average. They're putting on about 11 pounds more nitrogen, four and a half pounds less sulfur, um, and they're tending to do more splits um, by about a third. Their crop protection spend per acre is higher than the below average, but when you look at their crop protection spend, you divide that by bushels, their cost per bushel is lower. Um, and then if you go down to that bottom there, it says percent of yield potential, the above average group uh, averaged 61% of their yield potential, the below average group averaged 45%. That's about a 16% difference between the above and the below group of everybody in the project. And their overall average was 115. There's some good growers in this project. So there's some significant differences even of those that are participating in the program. The average yield of those in that high group is 129. The average of the below group is 102. That's a 27 bushel difference. And then um, we started to talk about the yield components. That's what the thousand grain weight is, um, the number of grains per head and the heads per meter squared and the grains per meter squared. Um, those are what make up your yield. So the more grains that you can produce per unit area and the heavier they are, the more your yield. So your management factors that you're doing need to affect them in some way. Um, so if we're having a negative effect with something, um, we wanna make a change. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is derive relationships. What is impacting those yield components? You know, um, why, is, why is there a difference in the number of grains per meter squared? You can see a pretty big difference uh, between the above average and the below average group. And, and what should our target be? How many grains do we want per meter squared? Well, in Europe, they're trying to target 20,000. And we're at 25 in the high group and 21 in the, in the below average group. But the thing that where we're really different, look at that 1,000 grain weight there. 36.1, 34.8, not a big difference in the above and below average group. What do they get in Europe? If you count out 1,000 kernels and weigh it, how much does it weigh? They're getting 50. So you think about the grains weighing 50 grams compared to 36 grams, that's a lot more yield. Okay? So they're not trying to produce more kernels per unit area. They're actually trying to produce less. They're planting less population. Um, and, and what they're trying to do is make those kernels fill bigger. And so you think about, we had a discussion about yield components and number of tillers this morning. Um, if you think about the way the grain head fills, it fills in the middle first, and, and so those kernels will be bigger, they will be heavier. Okay, so the thousand grain weight on the kernels in the middle of the head will be bigger, and as you go to the basal and distal ends of that head, the, the thousand grain weight gets less. So do you want to have more heads per unit area, or do you want to have less heads per unit area? How is that going to impact your thousand grain weight? You want less heads, yes. Because the more heads you have, the more basal and distal kernels you have, that's going to drag your average thousand kernel weight down. You might be doing good in the middle of the head, but your, your bottom and top of it is going to be dragging you down. So do we want to have more heads per unit area? No, we, we are getting about double what they are trying to target in Europe for a number of heads per unit area. So we're getting... In proportion, we're getting more of those smaller kernels by planting higher populations and getting more heads. So how far can we drag that back? I don't know. 
Um, that's why we're doing this project. Um, next, uh, I'll give you some information about some of the crop protection in that little table at the top. Um, it, basically, everybody in the program put fungicide on. There was 18 farms in Michigan, two in Ohio, and the 23 in Ontario. As far as PGR, we only had four farms in Michigan, two in Ohio, and then 14 in uh, Ontario put PGR on. And then for insecticide, we had uh, 13 farms in Michigan and nobody else put insecticide on in, in, of the 43 in the program. The, these next two uh, charts here are showing when fungicide was applied. So do you guys know what T1, T2, and T3 is for timing of application? T1 is early, like, like around feet six or so, like an early application of fungicide. T2 would be somewhere around that flag leaf emergence to protect the flag leaf, and T3 is your flowering fungicide. So this first chart is the number of farms that put only on one fungicide application, period. And the, the bar charts, the blue charts, are the number of farms that did a T1. So we had five farms that did only a T1 fungicide application. We had, it looks like, two farms did a T2, and then we had seven farms put on the T3, the flowering fungicide. And that's all the fungicide they put on. So the next chart, um, is some combination where they did more than one application of a fungicide. So you can see we had, um, looks like one farm did a T1 and a T2. The T1 and T3 is the most common with what, about 17 farms. That is what's being pushed in Ontario right now. So almost all of the Ontario growers are doing a T1 and T3 fungicide application. Uh, we had some growers do T2 and T3. We had uh, one do T1, T2, and T3. And then we had a couple growers put two fungicides on early, um, and then uh, one at T3. Um, and then here is their average yields. If I can get there, there we go. So this is the average yields that they got based on where they put on one fungicide application, multiple, and what, the, what they did. So you can see kind of what the results were. This is some of the information that you guys will get back if you're part of this YEN project. You will know what this is. Um, I'm sharing with you all this year uh, because I want you to get engaged in, in, in the project because we're, we're going to learn a fair amount of information. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, all right, so there's some limitations um, to, you know, what we're, we're able to do here, and I've mentioned some of them already. We, we, everybody wants to know, well, what did you learn? What, what's the biggest thing driving yield? In, um, you know, what is the number of tillers we should have and, and how much um, sulfur should we be putting on and so on. The goal is to develop that information over time. We get 400 growers contributing to this database and after about three years, we're going to be able to tell you what your soil test levels should be and what your tissue test levels should be. So in Europe, they are doing that, that little green bar on their, their reports, that is the benchmark. That is, they say, if you're below that number, you need to work on that. We want to get to there, but we're not there yet. So we have, we're limited to one year of data. Um, and one of the things we did find, we found several errors in the data collection. And when I went back and went over the reports with growers, we found some things that were reported wrong or, you know, one guy said, I think I must have fat fingered that when I entered it. And so we had the wrong rate. Um, so we got to make sure that we're collecting good data because if you want to see the answers, we got to make sure the data we're using is good. Um, the other thing, the NASA weather data is not very farm specific. They use a, um, a, it's either a 30 or 50 kilometer grid. And so within that whole grid, they assume your, your daytime high temperature was the same, the amount of rainfall was the same, the amount of solar radiation was the same, and that entire area. Well, we know that you can go from here to the next half mile, and the amount of rain you get here is going to be different than what you got in that next half mile. The data that we're using to collect this information is not, um, it's too granular, it's not specific enough. So we actually have some growers that are planning to install weather stations this year um, to get more accurate data on their specific field um, so that when we're making these projections and whatnot, um, you know, we're, we're able to do a better job. Um, and we also assume that water use is equal across all farms um, and that 20 millimeters of water translates to about 15 bushels in yield. So if you add up your soil water with your uh, rainfall, you can calculate this is the amount of water you have available. This is the maximum yield you can get because water will be limiting. 
um, at that point. So where do we go from here? Um, we want to continue to build this data set, as I mentioned, so we can create these benchmarks. Um, we want to uh, update these uh, critical values and thresholds. Um, and, and then we want to create more robust uh, management recommendations um, for growers. Uh, for example, seeding rates and dates and, and some of those things. So, and we want to gain a better understanding of what are the biggest factors limiting yield in, in the Great Lakes region. So I mentioned this a little bit before, this factory concept of, you know, we're trying to develop a crop canopy that can utilize all the resources that it has to the best of its ability to create yield. Um, so what are, what are the things that go into building that canopy? Well, the, the biggest things that we have to be able to utilize is sunlight and water. We gotta make sure all the nutrition and we don't have diseases and things like that occur. But those are the natural resources that we have to utilize. We can't control how much sunlight we get. We can't control how much water we get unless we have irrigation. So we have to figure out how to manage best to maximize the efficiency of those two inputs. So we're, we got to look at genetics, environment, management, and how all those three things, that's that G by E by M, how all those things interact together on, and impact our yields. Okay? So in terms of natural resources, I'm going to share with you just a little bit about how we use some of this information when we calculate your, that yield potential. So our yield is basically the addition of the amount of sunlight available and the amount of water. So if we look at light energy first, um, we know that we need light energy for photosynthesis. If you go back to your high school biology days, you remember learning about photosynthesis. We capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, the energy from the sunlight allows the plant to convert that carbon dioxide into sugars um, that is used for plant growth and development and then development of grain and, and filling of the grain. Okay, so the more sunlight energy we can capture, the higher our yield potential will be. Now we also need water um, available for this too as well because that's the way that, that plants take up nutrients. It's also the way the plant um, respires and conducts photosynthesis and it's also the way that it cools the plant also. It translocates water through the phloem and exits the stomates and that happens every day during photosynthesis. Um, when days get really hot above 85 to 90 degrees, the plant is using more energy trying to move water through the plant to keep it cool than what, it is, than what photosynthesis is occurring on that day. So you actually go backwards um, on days that are really, really hot. So we can't control when we have 90 degree days in a row, um, but that is something that we gotta try to manage. Maybe there's something on the, the genetics or the management end of things that we can do to try to figure out how to, to tolerate those high temperatures. So in terms of, if you think about the accumulation of light energy and when does that occur during the growing season, um, we can put it into the form of this uh, green chart here. And what it does is it shows the uh, total amount of accumulated light by the plant um, over time. And you can see early in the season, February, March, and you can see it ramping up, getting higher all the way up to May. And then about when we get just a little past flowering is about when we've peaked out on our light energy capture by the plant. And then as we get closer to physiological maturity and then grain dry down, the amount of sunlight that that plant can capture is, goes, steadily goes down to zero at physiological maturity. So that darker green band around that represents if we want to increase our yield potential by just 13%, what do we need to do? Well, you can see that that band is, is thinner early in the season, in January, February, March, April, um, in, into uh, May. So we do need to get that crop to capturing that sunlight earlier. So we want that, I think Dwight mentioned something about He's looking at his canopy. He wants to know early on, am I getting closure of that canopy? The earlier you can get it closed, the better. So narrower rows tend to do that. Um, so capturing a little bit, but look at where that green, darker green is the thickest. Where is it at? It's after flowering, isn't it? What can we do to extend that growing season, keep that crop greener longer? That's what we've got to look at if we want to increase our yield potential and capture more sunlight energy. What are things that we can do? We can apply some late season nitrogen. We gotta be careful not to burn leaves, but that tends to extend it. Um, we can select varieties that tend to be a little bit longer maturing varieties. Um, 
so there's a number of things that we need to look at if we're going to try to capture more of that sunlight energy um, and, and increase our yield potential. And I just wanted to show this. This is a, a daily accumulation of sunlight over a growing season. It starts in, what is that, Sep oh, August back there, and it goes through, what, September. And notice it goes way up and down, right? So you got cloudy days and sunny days, right? And the difference between that dashed green line at the top is the sunny days or cloudless days, and then the yellow line at the bottom is when it's cloudy out. There's a big difference. Can you impact that? Can you do anything from management-wise to impact that? No. All you can do is make sure you have a canopy that is healthy, that is green, that can capture every bit of available sunlight as possible. So cloudy days, in, in the UK they talk about dull days. They call them dull. It's a cloudy day like it is out today. Okay? You, there's, the plant conducts less photosynthesis on those days. So let's talk a little bit about water. We said it's required for photosynthesis and respiration, um, and we have to have it in order for the CO2 uh, uh, uptake. So the amount required, on a typical summer day, we use about three millimeters of water, um, which is about somewhere around a tenth of an inch of, of water. So if you, in, in, the, in order to produce a ton of biomass, um, it takes 1.7 inches of water. So if we use harvest index, and, on, and for these calculations, I assumed a harvest index of 0.52. That means that if you take all your above ground biomass, 52% of it is grain. The rest of it is leaves and stems and so on. Um, and actually that number, the average this year was low. It was 44. Um, the harvest index was 44 average for the young growers. Um, but for an 80 bushel crop then needs 9.9 .9 inches of water. A 100 bushel crop needs 12.4. And a 130 bushel crop needs 16.1. So as we think about how far can we push this, we got to have water available, okay? So we're going to get to a point where water is limiting, and in fact, we had, I think it was eight out of the 43 farms this year were water limited. We calculated how much water they took up and how much was available, and they were equal. When they're equal, that means that that site did not have enough water. The plant shut down too early because it didn't have enough water. So water plays a, a very important role. And the way we measure that um, is we, we can measure the amount of rainfall. So we're, right now we're, we were getting that from that NASA data set, but next year with this app that we're developing, I think we may be able to get that from there because I think that brings in um, a, a lot more weather stations of uh, information. But um, so we got the, it, we, we can, the other thing that we have as a resource to us is the Enviro Weather Network. We can get weather data and rainfall data from there. Um, they have about 90 different weather stations scattered across the state, so you just have to find one close to you. It's still not a perfect thing because, you know, one field gets one amount of rainfall, uh, a tenth of a mile down the road, it might be half that amount. But, and then we also measure soil available water. So we do that by, um, we use this USDA model called SPA, or Soil Plant Available Water. It uses the percent soil, or percent sand, silt, clay, and organic matter in the soil. So you're getting this, the soil texture, basically. And it estimates based on that, at the beginning, the total amount of water that the soil profile can hold. So we assume on the green up day in the spring um, that that soil profile is full. And that may not have happened this last spring because it was pretty dry. Um, when, when we warmed up. So we might not have had that water available, but we assume in our modeling that it is full. So we take that amount of water, add the rainfall that you got, and that is the total water that that plant had available to it. Now one of the downfalls of this is that we can have a dry period in there where we, we didn't get rain. The model doesn't really take that into effect. So we're looking at trying to update that to where we can have more of a, like a daily impact on, on water availability. But um, so this is how we're capturing that water data um, and using that to uh, calculate what the theoretical yield potential is. So some people were, you know, questioning where we were at, um, but, you know, we got to start someplace. So we, we may not be perfect on those um, yield estimates, uh, but we got to start somewhere. So just to wrap up here, um, it's not too late to sign up. Um, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we do have a website, greatlakesyen.com. Um, there is also that notepad out there on the end of the table. Put your name and, and number on there, and um, I'll get in touch with you. We have our kickoff meeting on 
uh, Friday. So uh, with that, I don't think I had anything else. Um, any questions? Jerry? Once we get enough years of data and enough farms, will this help with thinking about from a miller standpoint with quality as well as yield, perhaps years down the road where there might even be bonus offered for higher protein or whatever a miller is looking for in this area? That, that's a really good question and I didn't even mention that and it's not because it's not important, it's just a, I, there's only so much stuff you can put in. but. Um, yes, we are collecting quality parameters, including um, vomitoxin, falling numbers, and protein. Um, we're not doing any of the other, uh, you know, like Farinograph type data yet. Um, but yes, we do want to make sure we can push yields higher, but yet we're not sacrificing quality. Um, and we do have some uh, mills that are sponsors, and they are interested in that. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we are producing a quality crop. You know, we don't want to just move yields higher. We got to produce a crop that is um, millable, also. Question back here. And then yeah, does this program, if we sign up, come with a meter stick, or uh, do you convert all of our figures to metric? Um, <laughs> yeah. So I knew that was going to come up, um, and people don't like the metric system. Um, but how many of you know what? How many heads per uh, square foot you should have, or per square meter? You don't, you, those numbers don't mean anything to you now, so let's learn the metric system because we can directly compare it to uh, Europe. So that's the reason I've left those things in metric thus far. Otherwise, if you want to make those comparisons, you're like, oh, well, I got to convert it back to metric now. So, but the, the app will do those conversions back and forth um, seamlessly. You just tell it which one you want. All right, I'm digging into Dave's time. Any, any last thing other, before we switch over? All right. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me.